Hey guys, what's up? Matt here, CEO of 7th Level. This is a little bit of a different podcast. What we're gonna be doing is taking you through an actual training session that we do for our 3.0 members. So it's not our advanced inner circle, sort of uh, entry level programs. This is our mid, you know, more flagship kind of program called NEPQ 3.0. So I'm gonna be diving deep in a couple of different things, but really specifically around the commitment phase and then just the entire NEPQ process as I've been teaching this to them in my sort of weekly deep dive in every single part of it and I kind of go through each phase one by one. So it's a little bit of different content for you. I hope it gives you some insights and context in what it's like to, to be a part of our training programs but also what it's like to have one of our trainers in your business if you're someone who has a large team. So we hope you like it. Make sure you like, subscribe if you're on YouTube and all that kind of stuff, hit the notification bell. But uh, we really hope that you guys like and get something out of this program. A little bit of a debrief before we kind of get into some of the questions. So over the last few months, those of you who've been here for that long, we have been going over the NEPQ process from kind of top to bottom. Last week we went over the presentation phase, and this week what we're going to be covering is the commitment phase. It's a pretty short phase, so I'll cover it quickly, the sort of if, ands, whys, not to do's and not to do's, and then from there we'll go through questions that pertain to the that and then the entire process, right? So I'll start with a quick recap of the process itself because I can see an awful lot of new faces, right? So hopefully most of you guys know this because you've gone through your portal like good little boys and girls. However, I will assume that you have not. We've got the essential stages of NEPQ. Okay, these stages are the stages that the prospect needs to go through in order to tick all the boxes that you guys are gonna require for, to have the highest likelihood of getting a sale, right? Which is, these are not to do in one call or 10 calls or like whatever. This is just the journey the prospect has to go through in order to put them in a buying state. So you mold this, these phases to the process that you use, or you manipulate your process a little bit to make it work. But the best thing to do in the beginning when you're starting this is not to change too many things and add too many variables, as so to be able to not figure out what's working and what's not. So uh, stage one, uh, so is obviously connection phase. The point of connection phase is to kind of get the overarching goal and just sort of disarm the prospect, get them to not feel like they're in a sales process. That's really important because everybody hates being sold, but everybody likes shopping with a friend. So that's kind of it, right? You want to figure out like, what's the overarching goal? Like, what are we here for? What are you looking for? I'm here to get better at sales, for example. The next is situation. And that's really to, for the prospect to explore their current situation. It's not actually massively important for you as a sales rep, right? To understand that information. Because although it's interesting, if it goes too deep, it can be ultimately unproductive. I'll give you an example. I'm selling sales training. They start talking about the marketing. I don't care, right? That's just going to be of detriment to me. Same way as if I'm selling marketing and they start talking about the efficacy of their sales team. It's probably going to be detriment to me. So I don't really want to go too deep into it. All right, those are problems that I cannot solve. I never want to talk about problems I can't solve. So the situation phase, what are they currently doing about the thing that they're here to talk about? Like, what are you doing to get better at sales? What are you doing to get more leads? What are you doing to protect your family in case something does happen to you? What are you doing to mitigate yourself from the rises in energy costs? Make sense? Then we go to problem awareness. What are the problems associated with that goal? So what are the, what are the things that you're seeing? I don't know how, I don't know what, you know what I mean? Like all the problems that, that are associated with them not, not being able to achieve that initial outcome that they're looking for. Now it's important to denote um, that that initial outcome is not something that we're gonna dive deep on. A lot of other sales training methodologies teach to dive deep on problems and solutions very early to try and really kind of borrow down there. The reason why I don't think that's optimal, not that I think it's bad, but I don't think it's optimal is because it's very hard to get the appropriate level of trust and vulnerability from a prospect that early on. So if I, and uh, if you say take fitness, for example, and I'm selling someone over the phone, like I've done roughly 11 to 12,000 times in my day, I've made about 11 to 12,000 fitness sales. Like if I was to speak to someone over the phone, they were like, yeah, I need to lose five to 10 pounds. I can't see them, right? Maybe they have to lose 150, but they don't feel comfortable with telling me that over the phone. And then I dive deep on why 10 pounds is gonna be life-changing to them. And then I end up anchoring everything off a goal that is ultimately meaningless. Make sense, right? Now that's not their fault, they're not a liar. Buyers are not liars. It's just bad salespeople asking questions too early. If I walk into an elevator and go, hey Miles, what's your relationship with your mother like? That's a weird thing to do and say, but if we get stuck in the elevator, maybe we get there. 
Okay, so problem awareness, really that's what we're trying to discuss. What's the problem? How long has it been a problem? What's causing the problem and what impact is that problem having? All right, those are the, those are the real four main pillars that you're trying to get. Then from there, we use the rationale question to then transition into solution awareness. That's a bridging question. It's not really a problem awareness question or a solution awareness question. It's a bridging question that, that, that sort of conversationally bridges the gap between one and the other because you don't want to have like these jarring uh, Q&A level experiences in a sales process where you're like, you've been talking about one thing and then you realize you're off track and you go, so anyway, and you kind of pivot because you realize that you're trying to make a sale. So that rationale question also serves a few purposes and it's a very important question for everyone to get right. If you were to not adapt any PQ entirely, which I think is probably not a bad move for a lot of people, especially in the short to medium term, you would add in rationale question, you would add in consequence questions and that would probably create a significant increase in sales, right? Because of what it does. So the rationale question is structured in a way that gets rid of a few objections. So it, what it's designed to do is designed to sort of get the prospect to ideate on the few on, on what would happen if they continued on the logical conclusion. Like what's the slippery slope of what they do? Just so I can see the rationale behind why you might be looking for, I don't know, like a better sales system and structure to actually make more sales. What's the main reason for doing it that way rather than just taking more calls? For the newer people to the call, right? Yeah. That have just signed up in the last week or so. Why do you recommend that like uh, maybe not adapting any PQ in its entirety is recommended in the short to medium term? Like why why only bits and pieces? Yeah, so you're learning a methodology and you're learning a skill set and uh, skill sets take time to learn and adapt. Like throwing out what has been working, like, like let's say you're closing at 10%. It's still 10%, right? So if you then throw away all the elements and then start something new, even if it's far superior, your lack of skill set and understanding of that thing will cause you to close even lower or at the same as what you do now, which will mean that you'll become disheartened and frustrated very quickly. But in reality, like that's just part of the process. So what you would do is you would assess, I think, some of the gaps that you have in your current process and what gaps an APQ can fill. So maybe you use highly assumptive languaging and you go like, I cannot wait to help you pick the best policy for you and your family today, right? Like that would be a highly assumptive thing to say because like you don't know that you even can do that. Like if we're talking about reality, what if they just don't tick the boxes and you can't do it, right? So you'd say, hey, it looks like you're possibly, you know, hey, it looks like you, you know, scheduled the quarter day to look at possibly getting some more protection for your family in case something does happen. How can I help? Right? So even just adopting a more, a less assumptive, more neutral languaging would be, could be, maybe, might be, should be, you know, possibly, maybe those things, they reduce sales resistance and they make the conversation easier, right? Then if you looked and realized, oh, I never really ask consequence questions. Consequence questions are there to drive urgency, right? They create the juxtaposition of the, 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 the want to move forward and the, and the possibility of failure, right? What happens if you don't do anything? You don't get a policy in place and God forbid something does happen to you over the next two days, two weeks, two months, two years, two decades and, you know, your wife is left with a mortgage that she can't pay. What happens then, right? And just like the sheer asking of that question is going enough to make them think about what happens if they don't, which it gives them more motivation to move forward, right? I've got a gold medal I'm running towards and I've got a lion I'm running away from. I will run faster, right? If, if you wanna look at it in that way. So just adding that would be beneficial, you know? Uh, if you don't have any structure whatsoever, then what you would wanna do is listen to a bunch of calls, figure out what subtle subconscious structure you do use and then make sure that you're asking problem awareness questions. You, you, you're asking solution awareness, you're asking some consequence questions and then from there you're, you're presenting your pitch in a way that's concise and makes sense, right? So, and, and you would just adapt more and more and more as you go. But would I recommend like, hey, I've been making 20K a month for the last five years, I'm just gonna throw everything away and do this. Like, uh, I've not hit a level of arrogance yet where I would recommend that. I'm sure I will in the coming years um, however, at this stage of my life, I'm not there yet. So um, that, that's an important thing for everyone to, to, to uh, like acknowledge. Don't just throw your shit out. Like it's a bad idea. If there's stuff that you do that works, keep doing it until you can figure out a better way to do it, uh, adapting what we do. I believe that we have the best method of selling. However, like whatever makes you money is what you should do. <laughs> right? Right? So let's not get on our too high a horse. So, uh, we've got um, the rationale question, right? So that's designed to kind of get rid of DIY and have the person kind of tell you 
in very clear terms why the logical conclusion of what they're doing would never work. Just so I can understand why you guys want, I guess, a better, you know, process to get new recruits in and be able to actually hold those. Like, what's the main reason for wanting to staff up your sales team that way or your, or your HR department that way instead of just, like, going through, you know, the traditional methods like what a lot of other companies do and just accepting the churn rate is, that's just what it is. You know, so, like, the, you can kind of adapt it to whatever you want, right? Um, I only just said that because I was just training a recruiting guy. So then from there, we got solution awareness. And solution awareness, like, for me, uh, personally, in my sort of style, is where a lot of the selling is done because I, I very much like the, the future pacing and like the, the talking about goals, wants, needs, desires, all that kind of stuff. Like that's, I think, like where the highest level of persuasion can be, can be done. So uh, what you really want out of solution awareness, what is the goal, right? So you want to really dial in on that goal. So you take that goal like we talked about before in the fitness of five to ten, and then you would kind of ask if that's really what they want and you try and stretch that goal. The key is to stretch it far enough to where it's kind of ju just out of reach, right? <laughs> right? Um, but like not so far that it's unattainable, right? Like if you're speaking to a company that wants to, you know, increase their lead or you're speaking to a guy that just wants to protect his family through an insurance policy and you're like, you know, and then you start future pacing him on leaving a hundred million dollars for his kids. It's just like, it's not going to happen. So like it's such a large goal that it becomes unattainable. And then like the steps required in their mind are, are so vast and many that like there's just, it's just too terrifying to even start. Make sense? Like if someone, if I'm dealing with a super large weight loss client, like for example, that needs to lose 400 pounds, I would reduce that to like 60 or, or 100, right? Like get a really good first milestone that's gonna be within the like initial engagement period that we're gonna be talking about, right? So it needs to be difficult, um, but achievable. Can't be really easy because then it lacks urgency. So if their goal is like, you know, let's use a sales training goal, I want to get it from five to six K a month. Like that's just not enough. Like it's not enough to like tangibly change anything, right? So that like, it just doesn't work, you know? Um, so you want to be able to push that gap far enough. And then from there, like what are the, what are the tangibles that happen when we achieve the goal? Like what are the outcomes? How is it different? Like, and that, that is ubiquitous across industry, whatever it is. Like, there is a, there, when we solve the problem, achieve a solution, what are the differences? And then from there, if we can attach an emotion to the difference, that's when it starts to get super juicy. And that's when, like, salesmanship comes into play, because if you're talking to someone who's, like, middle management, then, like, the sale might be, like, the recognition, like, the outcome might be the recognition of them bringing in this initiative. And what would that do for their career? Like, and that's why like there is always a sale to be made and there is always an emotional component because humans have to biologically feel something to do something. Like it's just the way it works. You feel like putting your left shoe on first, you feel like eating pasta. Like it's an emotional response and then you have an action that's associated with it. Then from there we move into consequence. So, consequence, so the solution awareness is like pushing the ball forward and future pacing out. And the consequence is the is the opposite of that. So it's the what happens if we stay in the same place, we keep doing the same things, we get the same outcome or potentially gets even worse. Or like what are the actual ramifications of that? And how you talk about that is gonna be uh, dependent on what you sell. Like if you're talking like more business to uh, business, you're like, what are the possible, have you considered the possible ramifications of not, you know what I mean? Whereas if you do more, B2, more, more B2C, you're like, well, like what happens if you don't do anything? And there's a lot of tonal cues and all that kind of crap, but like, we're just talking about straight process here. Then from there, now that you've got the, the an, like an initial outcome, the situation, what they're doing about it, the problems associated with it, if they solve the problems, what would the solution be? If they get, if they get that solution, like what happens if they don't? Then we have a really good area that we can play in, and then we go into our presentation, right? And then we go into our commitment. So our presentation wants to be no more than about 10% of the total sales cycle. The reason why, from like a, like a scientific standpoint is because like it's very easy to drop out of emotional state like of like more creative emotional thinking state but very hard to get back in so like let's just say you have a, a video editor or a songwriter and you tap that songwriter on the shoulder and go hey man like um what software system are you using and how much does that cost uh thanks bro 21 minutes before he gets back into the state where his brain is like fully in that creative brain. That's the average human response, 21 minutes. So if you go from like this emotional sales process of which like all sales processes are more emotional than not, 
because you're digging into wants and needs, like it's just what it is. Then from there to go into a highly logistical pitch that is very numbers and detail focused, takes them out of that. And then when you ask for the money, you really want that emotion on your side. But by having a 15 minute PowerPoint presentation, you are doing yourself a massive disservice. By all that good work and goodwill that you've put in throughout that sales process, you've now undone all of it, right? So you need to figure out a way to keep the presentation like not super detailed and logistical, but still provide all the information, which becomes the tricky part, right? So you gotta constantly remind them of the things that they're talking about throughout it. Now, the, you know, our first pillar is all about it, like, you know, a roadmap, because like, so what we do is we kind of lay everything out, we do yada, 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 because you know how you said that like you were struggling with X, Y, and Z, and I think that was causing you to be, I think you'd said somewhat frustrated, was that right? Yeah, well, like, what, like, what did you mean when you said that? Ah, okay, like that makes sense. Yeah, so what we do is we do this, and that's designed to really kind of stop that frustration and make sure that you have a really, really good uh, plan moving forward. Does that make sense? Okay, perfect. So then we do the presentation, do all that kind of stuff, and then we go into the commitment phase. The commitment phase is really, really simple, really, really basic, and it's really just about like um, getting that person to go through a series of questions that get them more bought in on the presentation. So the way that I would finish my pitch, go, does that make sense? You know, and then from there you can do like the investment, whether you do the investment top or bottom, whatever, it's up to you. Um, and you go like, okay, cool. So in order to kind of do all this and, 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 and be able to actually put X, Y, and Z together so that we can solve the problem of X, the funding required is going to be this, right? Would that be appropriate? Or do you feel like this could be the answer for you? So that's our first commitment phase. Now we're not saying, do you want to buy? Do you want to do it? How do you want to move forward? Do you want the red or the blue or the black or the white, the one or the two? We're not option closing them because they're not morons. Option closes work on four-year-olds or people who are gonna buy anyway. Not that the puppy dog close, the option close, the Benjamin Franklin close, right? Those things all work, right? You can buy the book, 101 Ways to Close, right? Or 1,001 Ways to Close, right? But they're just like, they just work on people who are gonna buy. Like, they, they don't aid in the sale. They might not detract either but I don't think they move the ball forward in any meaningful way because you're just asking for a sale. And I don't believe that asking for a sale is really any good in any environment. So the way that we do it is we go, do you feel like this could be the answer for you? Now, because I'm asking it that way, the likelihood of them saying no is astronomically low. They might say yes, but, okay? They'll go, yeah, and then as soon as they say yes, I interrupt them. I don't want them to finish the thought. I interrupt, they go, so, so do, you feel like, do you feel like this could be the answer for you? Yes, okay, well, do you mind, do you mind telling me why? I've, I've started talking the moment they go, yeah, right? <laughs> right, like the moment they open their mouth, I go, do you mind telling me why? Because then what they're gonna do is they're gonna immediately redirect into thinking about the pitch and going like, yeah, well, you know, I think that that, like that structure that you'd mentioned of being able to have access to all oh, this, this, and this, I really feel like that would, that would really help. And you go, okay, well, that makes sense. I guess, is there anything that you feel like, I don't know, is like the sort of key to the castle for you into making sure that you can actually, and then you insert what they want. And they go, well, then they're gonna think more deeply about the presentation. And they're gonna think about the pillars. And they're gonna think about what it is they feel is of most benefit to them. Okay, and then so they're gonna explain deeper. So what happens when they explain deeper from an emotional level is beca it becomes their argument. Like if, I, if I'm really, if someone says something hyper-productive and I push and I, and I challenge them on that, you know, so I, one of the ones I used to do all the time is I used to do, like I used to push back on people. They go, no, I think I really need to do this now. I go, well, you don't have to. Like no one's gonna make you do this. You might be that new year, new me guy that everyone talks about. That'd be cool. New year, new me. They go, no, nah, I've done that before. It never works out. I just really need to do it now. All right, calm down. Right, so like they're like, just by me like pushing back on them the tiniest bit, it makes them dig into the idea even harder. It's a phenomenal tactic that works everywhere, not just in the sales. I've done it at like reception desks at, you know, at like hotels and shit. They do something be like, whoa, you don't have to do that. That's crazy. And they go, no, 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 I'm definitely, no, 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 like Mr. Boone, I'm gonna make sure that you get everything. Like, whoa, super helpful, thank you so much. Label them as helpful, come back next day, ask for something. You know, you've been so helpful. I wonder if I could ask you a favor. Oh yes, of course, Mr. Brown. Right? Like, there's, like people love labels and shit. Anyway, once you start learning how to persuade people, you can get what you want almost all the time. And then from there, once we get that little bit of commitment, we can go, all right, man, like I don't, I don't really have much else for you from here. And, and only if you feel like it's appropriate, what we could do is go ahead and organize your payment. We could do that with X or Y or Z. And then from there, we send out, you know, that gives us the permission 
to be able to actually start the process of being able to, and then you say insert what they want. Would that be appropriate or how would you like to proceed from here? And so, and then from there, like what that does by saying, would that be appropriate or how would you like to proceed from here? Is it, is, is it, is it opens many doors. One of the things that I really, I guess, disagree with in like sort of sales culture is that like it's, there's like a weakness, like you like be, go, be ask for this, rah, right? Go ask for like be aggressive, ask for the sale. It's like, well, yes and no. I think it's good to be confident, but I think like you don't need to be assertive. Like that, like, like when it comes to asking for a sale, like that's, that's not the play, I don't think. And I can justify why is because like, if you do an option close, be like, all right, so like what works best for you? We're gonna do this one or this one over this one, this one, Visa or MasterCard, you know, Amex or Diners, right? <laughs> So like they, they can choose, but then the next question is always gonna be like, okay, so like, let's do it. And I can still go no. So like, I just don't see the point. I just feel like it's like Kabuki theater, right? It's like, it's all pretend. So what I, what I would do is like, I like to do it and I like to invite conversation. Because if you invite conversation, the conversation never has to stop. There, there comes a point where like, they're gonna run out of steam a hell of a lot faster than I do when it comes to handling concerns, especially if you know how to do it. So like by giving them outs. So if you give someone a binary, a yes or a no, you have to backtrack from the no and then move forward. So you're constantly doing three steps back, four steps forward, three steps back, four steps forward. It's a really arduous and combative way to get a sale if they do have genuine concerns, right? Which it's fair enough. If you're asking for $15,000 or something to sales train someone for six months, like it's fair enough to have a concern. It doesn't mean that I'm not gonna get that sale, but having a concern is fair enough. If you have a $450,000 SaaS solution, fair enough. There's change management to think about. There's tons of stuff to think about, but we can work through it. So you wanna continually take steps forward and you don't wanna take steps back. So by going, how would you like to proceed from here? They can say anything. They can go, yeah, you know, it sounds really good from here. What I'd love to do is just kind of, you know, make sure with finance that this is actually gonna work and then just, you know, run it through my business partner and then just sort of take the time to think to see if this is what we wanna do. Like, oh, yeah, man, that's not a problem. And like, I guess if, if, if money wasn't a concern here and say finance was on board and you guys had the budget, do you, feel like, do you feel like this would be the answer for you? Okay, cool, do you mind telling me why? All right, perfect. And like, I guess, you know, and then what are some ways that we think that we can come up with the money or do the budget allocation so that you guys can get the trainings so that you can actually stop, you know, churning these people through at the rate that you are and potentially have the problem get worse, right? And you can, you can go through your process. Then from there, you can resolve that money concern you can move through, agree upon payment terms, right? Because like you're, you're not even asking for the sale, you're just discussing it, right? And you go like, okay, cool. So monthly payments of, you know, uh, 4,700, like that works within your guy's current budget. Well, yeah, you know, yeah, I guess it does. I guess it does. All right, cool, man. And how would you like to proceed from here? Well, you know, I just really need to make sure that the partners are on board and then we just have to make sure that it's in the corporate strategy. All right, cool. And if your partners are on board, you know what I mean? You just go through your partner objection, right? You go through your board objection because you guys have access to a lot of that. You just memorize all that stuff and you just go through it, go through it, go through it, go through it seamlessly until you get down to like, you know, a point where you've handled all logistical questions. There is no longer any logistical hurdles that are in the way of getting this sale. And so now it's mono a mono and you can then start doing other stuff. Hey, you know, just between me and you and kind of off the record, what's really holding you back? Ah, well, they tell you, right? You know, so, and then we have processes for that. So like, you know, by allowing that door to stay open, you can address all the concerns. And maybe the concern can't be addressed on that call. Maybe you have to book a next one. But at least like you've done the work to understand the true concern to get the best next step, right? But if you are constantly asking for yes, no binaries, you're having to take, it'll take you 45 minutes to get to that point, whereas we can do it in 10. And we're not being combative because it's like, how do you want to proceed from here? And they proceed with a concern. Perfect. How do you want to proceed from here? <laughs> Right? Like, like they're choosing the path, but like the path that they, the path that they can choose get narrower and narrower, but they feel like they're in control. Hence it never gets combative. You don't lose sales because you're just bullying people into doing stuff, which you can do. And it does work. It's just not as effective over the long term. Does that make sense? In terms of a process, broken that down. Happy Larry, right? The commitment phase, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. What it's designed to do overall NEPQ, uh, a little bit more complicated, but still super, super learnable. And now I will go through questions. All right, Nathan. I kind of just wanted to, uh, since we're on this particular phase, just kind of go through my script with my particular opportunity and make sure I got it all dialed in correctly and then get out of your hair. Like, share my screen or how? Yeah, go for it. How would you, you do that? 
How would you like to proceed? Yep, you can share your screen if that's what floats your boat. So just as a refresher, I'm an Etsy coach. I sell an Etsy coaching course program to help people get their shops to where they want to or launch a new shop most of the time just to fix up their shop because they suck at it. All right, so just go up a little bit. Have you got the pitch there? Um, yeah, like three pillars and stuff, yeah. yeah or a few things that might be able to help you with the situation and so your problems. The course, our biggest, uh, one of the biggest problems where I see sellers have, don't say that. Oh? I don't, I don't know who, 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 like who cares about what the biggest problems I see sellers have. Talk about their problems. Okay. Right? Like, so you want, it wants to be like the a best, a good pitch sounds like it's custom. All right. So how would I word that as far as to them? So I was just going to like the generic script or whatever. So like, what is that pillar? It's they have like, what is that pillar one? It's the course pillar. And there's three sub pillars. Is that, or is that just like how you've broken it down? The course pillar. That's just yeah, like the, the three step formula. Anthony's, uh, okay. A combination of Anthony and Jeremy's presentation stuff. Okay. One of the biggest problems I see have is that they're trying to build shops that they don't actually know the steps in order to take and maintain a profitable shop. So what we do is, is we take a step by step through it shows the compensation functionally. Uh, step by step on the training platform, the most condensed, most robust version of information. I'm not gonna lie, I don't like it. Okay. I think like it's it, okay, it, like it's fine, but like I just don't think it's gonna like speak to them very deeply. Right. Okay. You know, so the way that like I like to structure it is like not super different to how you've structured it, but like the way that I like to have the feel is like I could do so many things for you, right? But like this is what you need, you know? Like it's a very, like it's very personalized and very like bespoke. I like that. Okay. You know? So like if they feel that way and they feel like it addresses their specific problems, you know, and it's and it's made for their specific problems, then like they're gonna have a more, you're gonna be able to carry the emotion. So pillar one is all about information, right? One of the things that I think you'd mentioned is that you, you just weren't quite sure exactly what to do, when to do, how to do. So what I've done is I've created a course. Now, I don't really expect you to go through the entire course, because to be honest, like maybe you do over time, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna like really kind of cherry pick the things that I think that you should go through first, because I really respect your time and I wanna make sure that you're just not running through a portal all day, right? But in that portal, like and in that course information, what we're gonna go through is we're gonna give you a really, really robust structure of how you can assess where you're currently at and then create the educational roadmap to where you need to be. And what that really means for you is that you're gonna spend less time kind of searching the internet for like information here, there, and everywhere, and you're gonna spend less time doing a more effective, highly targeted educational program for yourself, where you can do it in your own time, so you're not pigeonholed to any sort of, you know, schedule on that. Because I, like, I think you'd mentioned that you, you know, you didn't have tons of time, but you still want to learn stuff. And so what I want to do for you is create that educational journey that doesn't actually take you away from your kids, take you away from your family. Like, does that make sense? They go, ah, oh, yeah. And then I go, and that kind of brings me into pillar number two, which is all about coaching. Now it's all well and good to give you a portal and give you a PDF and give you a tap on the bum and say, I'll see you in 12 weeks. But a lot of us need that kind of accountability to stay on track, right? And so what we're gonna do is create a, a coaching program for you over the next six months that gives you access to specific skill sets, specific Q and A's, yada, 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 yada. Cause I think you'd mentioned this. So what we're gonna do is this, does that make sense? Now the last one is accountability. Now before I go any further, I wanna make sure, are you open to actually being held accountable, actually having someone hold your feet to the fire so that you can, you can really do X, Y, Z? Cause if you're not like, this just isn't gonna work. But like, is that something that you're open to? Yes, okay, do you mind telling me why? Ah, oh, okay, that makes sense. All right, so pillar three is all about accountability. I'm gonna hold your feet to the fire and you've now edified me as the person that is here to hold your hand through this and get you to do things that are uncomfortable or even previously uncharacteristic. So if you're okay with that, then we can talk about the investment and how that works. Would that be okay? Perfect. All right, cool. So that, you know, that, that structure that I put together, does that make sense? Yes, you go through all that. The investment is this. How do you wanna proceed from here, right? That make sense? Like, so it's a bit more, like a little bit more conversational, like probably hitting a lot of the same points that you're hitting, but writing it in a more conversational manner where you hit the emotional points and give them the outcomes that it gives them. Like, I don't care what you're giving me. I don't care. And neither do you. Like, do any of you guys know that you had 52 sales coaching sessions a week when you signed up to NEPQ 3.0? Like, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Who gives a shit? Right? If I tell you to go knit in the corner for 45 minutes a day and I'll double your clothes rate, you better start knitting, boy. Right? Do you know what I mean? Like, the mechanisms on some level are irrelevant. Now, obviously we can't just like sell 
magic beans, right? Like we have to provide a solution that works and that's essential. And the better you get at sales, the more of, <laughs> the more of a necessity is to really make sure you're selling something good because you can do some serious damage, right? But like the detailed mechanisms are relatively irrelevant in most cases and can be handled elsewhere. But like the over, so the way that you kind of structure it, I think should be a little bit more conversational, a little bit like, pulling right so if you want to take like the the recording of what we've taken today or whatever then like that might be helpful or you can just probably listen to the podcast so um yeah that's really kind of how i would do it especially for what you're selling because you're selling sort of like a much more emotional coaching service to small business owners who are either side hustling looking to transition whatever it may be plus it's high ticket so more emotion the better i'm sure mm -hmm. all right then from there do you feel as though it might be maybe you're what you're looking for? Does that feel as though it might be maybe? <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of neutrality. Let's just simplify that. Now that was that was okay. that was that was going to be my point of feedback when you scrolled up. Is does that feel as like it might be you know what you're looking for? It, than, should I throw possibly in there too? Maybe yeah, yeah. Throw possibly, possibly could be. Um, <laughs> yeah, throw them, throw them all in there, but just make sure you indicate to yourself that those are optional and not in. Yeah. And I see, and, and this is important, I think for everybody, because there are certain parts in the script where you'll see something is doubled or like an alternative way to say it. it is not there for you to say that thing. It's there as an option for you to execute one or the other, or that there's a ellipsis like that, like make sure it doesn't make more sense as an or statement. It's almost never going to be an and statement because number of people I see butcher a rationale question by having all of the possible variations <laughs> in one go is astonishing. Yeah. If it, if it feels read too weird, you got to reword it, you know? Um, do you feel like this could, this could be the answer for you? And so like, like, I think like I was saying last week, like you can convey neutrality and intent through like a multitude of different ways. Like what you've done here is you've done might be maybe, right? So, but you could lose those words and say it in a neutral way. Does that feel as if it's what you're looking for? So I'm asking it curiously. So I don't, I don't know, you tell me, right? So my, my tone has given the underlying intent of the question. So um, the, all the pre-written scripts are in Inner Circle Jessica. Sorry, we give uh, the, the outline here, the generic sort of script, and then from there we fill it in in sessions. So the reason why we have uh, done for you scripts in Inner Circle is because if you haven't done 2.0 or 3.0 first, you will completely shit the bed. Like if I give you a script, like it is the worst thing I can do for your sales career because you'll absolutely butcher it without the underlying fundamentals or having built a script on your own. The idea is you do all this stuff, build a script. It's pretty good, but not amazing. Come into Inner Circle, we'll write it for you. It'll be incredible and you know how to use it. We used to just sell Inner Circle. People would just butcher it. It just didn't, it didn't work, <laughs> right? Like I can convey my intent by the word choice, which is what you've done here. I can convey my intent through the the like inflections, up or downward, right? If I ask a question with a downward inflection, it sounds very concerned and curious. Right? If I ask it with an upward inflection, it's just curious. I can um, use body language, right? If I say, why aren't you better at sales? And if I put my hand on my heart and say, why aren't you better at sales? Like it comes from a different place. It feels very different. The, the intention is different, so it feels different. Then you've got the pausing, right? So when and where I pause, so if you go up to that question, like you've got the ellipses there, so you've got the pauses in there. Does that feel as though it might be maybe what you're looking for? Like I, I had, to, I just naturally had to make my uh, tone quite neutral because I'm using all the other cues. And then the last one, sorry, it's gonna be uh, pacing. So speaking fast and slow, right? Like when I coach, I speak quite slowly because I have to be understood. In my day to day, I talk much, much faster much, 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 much faster. And when I sell, I, I do a combination of both. There's a few reasons for that. First of all, it's to convey intent. Second of all, is to sometimes create confusion on purpose. But the problem becomes if I do everything, if I do all those five things, like it will be so overwhelming that I will sound like a weirdo. Does that feel as though it, though it might be maybe what you're looking for? Like, dude, f calm down. Like, bro, we're in a sales call. Like, we're not, like, we're not in therapy, right? So, like, you've got to be careful if you overdo it. So, like, like that, like, you'd have to know, all right, cool, I can ask it that way, but i got to be, like, real neutral tonality when I say that. My pacing has to be consistent. You know what I mean? Like, I can't, I can't do any of this stuff that I would look at doing. And that's why everyone f***s up that, do you like 
what you're doing, right? Everyone goes, do, so do you, do you like what you're doing now? And it's like, whoa, bro, calm down. Like, don't do everything. Does that make sense? Like, again, you can say it, you can write it exactly like that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that as long as you are aware of the things that you can't do if you're doing that. So what I would say from more of a beginning or learning standpoint is like pick the things that you're gonna like go on, like pick the things I'm gonna do neutral language and I'm gonna do pausing. Those are the things I'm gonna work on. Sweet, then from there you can manipulate that question to kind of be appropriate. Say it out loud a bunch of times, say it to people. If they get weird responses and they're like, okay, like that, then chances are you gotta tone it down a little bit. Or if you're getting really vague answers, then chances are you gotta tone it up a bit. If you get super vague answers and your, your intent is not being conveyed clearly enough, you know, so like that's when specificity of like wording because one of the things is the word choice, right? So maybe what you're looking for is just a very, very vague word choice. So I, the way I do is, do you feel like, do you feel like this could be the answer for you? And so like, that's pretty simple. It's very clear, but I say it in a very neutral way. I do a little bit of double speak, a little bit of pausing. I can a little bit razzle dazzle, right? And then, you know, from there, like they know what I'm trying to say and it's, it's conveyed in like a normal way. Okay, so why do, why do you feel as it is though? Okay, uh, in what way? Okay, but besides that, what specific parts of the training program do you feel like? Cool, again, I think like for what you're selling, you could just be like, you know, I think you could, again, make it more uh, casual and conversational. Right? Like, I don't know, like it depends if that reflects how you speak in normal day. But if you have like a, if you have quite a, I guess, professional day-to-day -day speaking, you know, someone like me, <laughs> right? No, so like, the, you know, like I'm, I'm very casual and very like non-professional, I think would be the, the technical term for how I am as a human. Um, but like Jeremy is different, right? So Jeremy would like get away with saying things that would sound weird coming from me just because of like how I am as a person. So yeah, do you feel like this program would be the best possible? Yeah, why, why that? So do you feel like, I think that's a bit, it's a bit, um, I'm gonna use a cool word, duplicative, all right? It's a bit duplicative to have that in there. Like you're, you've already asked it, you've asked it again, then from there you're asking. So it kind of feels like you're like, it kind of feels like you're doing something, you know? Like they're gonna catch wind that you're a filthy sales rep trying to take their money. Right, uh, okay, well, I have some company today. It looks like we cover all the bases we possibly be looking for, where the next it would be, if think it's appropriate, is we can go to yada, 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 get the ball rolling, uh, and get with your one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching. So what I would do is in that, I would say, get the ball rolling so we can, and then insert their emotional driver. Not even the outcome they're looking for, the emotional driver. Whatever that driver is, and start you on the path to financial freedom so you can spend more time with your kids, right? Like whatever that like the outcome from getting the thing is, put that there. Because then that starts thinking the more like emotion solution based thinking instead of like tangible. Because like if you tell me one on one coaching, like for me with my schedule, I immediately think, right? Like, how am I going to schedule this? So like it gets me into my into my logical brain, takes me out of my emotional brain, right? Which is why you probably weren't told the times of the sessions when you're sold. You probably weren't told how many there were either, because if I tell you the times and how many, it's just gonna cause problems. Okay, appropriate now, and you like proceed when they ask for the, so when they ask for the price, okay, cool. So the investment, uh, I like funding, but I think investment works, but I think you should trial both to see what lands better. Do like 20 sales call on investment, 20 sales call on funding, see which ones you felt landed better, and then from there roll with that, right? Okay. Um, it's just depending on like the, on like the avatar as to like what words we'll use better. 100%. What, what words, <laughs> speak good me, right? Like what, like what will work better depending on the avatar. If you get someone with an existing store that's looking to ramp or you get someone who's looking to, you know, part time and wants to go, like they, it just might work differently and you'll learn to feel that out I think over time. Because little things like that can make a difference. Um, and at this stage, you're looking for ways to not screw the sale up. You're not looking for ways to make the sale. Like, I hope that that's been somewhat clear. Like, at this stage, they should already be sold, right? Right. Like, we're just trying not to undo it. I mean, I've, what seems to be working, because I've gone in between, but it seems to be working when they ask for the price. And this is how I was sold with uh, the NEPQ. Yeah, you can. Uh, with this, this program where I just I just pop up the sales page and kind of, do like a 10 second review scrolling through like, so this is blah, yeah. da, 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 blah, blah, and then, and then. Yeah, that's, that's actually good like compliance stuff, right? This is what you're getting. 
This is exactly how long it's going to take. This is what it is. If you have a refund policy, tell them. Like, you should say all that stuff. Like, there's compliant. I'm not going to go into it because, like, I'm not going to be held liable for any of you doing crazy stuff, right? But, like, there are regulatory compliance things. There are things that constitute verbal contracts, things that don't constitute verbal contracts. Now, if your verbal contract does not line up with your written, right, then both are invalid. Okay. Right? So just be aware of that. You see a little, I agree with the terms and conditions. I hope they match up, you know, whatever. Yeah, it's, it's, cool that, yeah. it's cool that you agree with the terms and conditions. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like they have to agree with the terms and conditions. <laughs> yeah, you can't tick that box for them, just so you know. You can, but it's meaningless, right? So anyway, that's a good way of doing it. Let's see how it works. That's all fine. Then you're basically, how do you want to proceed from here? Make this up. Sweet. So we made some adjustments. Uh, make a couple of them, see how you go, and just think about the stuff that we talked about in terms of like the actual guiding concepts and principles, and then from there, I, I hope it makes sense. I will tweak that for sure. Thank you, Matt. No worries. Can you unshare your screen, please? And then I will go through TLB. I do apologize for swearing, too. No, you don't. You don't care. I mean, I'm, I want to be very clear that the seventh level corporation apologizes on my behalf. However, me as a human doesn't care. All right. Anyway, I'm just kidding. All right, TLB, is that how I should refer to you as? Tina here. Nice to meet you. I sell um, engine repair for aircraft, en um, aircraft okay. engine <laughs> maintenance, uh, overhauls, awesome. inspections, AOG, that sort of thing. So I just started putting my script together this week. And um, earlier, we had an er earlier call with Will, and it, there was some clarification that... Um, Although sometimes I, I do B to C, there is uh, the process is B to B, how he explained it. And then I reviewed your uh, B to B in the, in the, um, in the portal. And so um, I guess I need some, I need some clarification around scripting versus proposal, right? It, proposal versus scripting, because um, I'm, Typically, I'm uh, doing a straight um, call, calling into, uh, and I'm, I'm asking for the uh, aviation manager or the director of maintenance. And yep. um, so I, I have to use better word choice for, um, you know, my, you know, I, well, probably all, all my all my phases actually at this point. So yeah, let me ask you a question. Like. Um... You've been doing this for a while. Well, I've been on. I've been in aviation for like 15 years, but I've been on the charter side. Um, okay. And then I, I, I've, I've been in. I've been selling, not actually selling maintenance. I've been selling kind of a lot of the different aspects of aviation. So this particular call is for um, engine overhauls, inspections. Okay, so I understand what you I understand what you're asking, and I'm going to be a little bit annoying and just ask a few more questions. What's the, the sale, are they coming to you as existing clients and you're managing the accounts and upselling or are you maintaining the accounts or are you getting in new accounts? We're um, getting new accounts, but we're also um, keeping, we, we want we want to increase um, client retention. So that's okay. really important as well. So okay. it's, it's, a newer, it's a newer rebranded company. So the trust factor isn't really there in the industry right now. Although we do have people that have been in the industry for a long time that do have trusted reputations. So that's kind of like the objection right now. We don't really know you, who are you? We've never, you know, kind of thing. How do we know you're not a fly by night type of- um... Yeah, yeah. So you got to address things in two ways. The first thing you can address things is through a process look, and then you can address things through a skills look, right? The hard way of doing it is going skills first. So like, if you're like struggling with some of those like uh, consistent concerns, what I would do is generate a process that is designed to somewhat overcome them, right? Uh, to the best of the degree, because what you want in, a, in a, an ideal sales process, like th when the client, when the prospect comes in, the calls they have, the communication in between, what things that they see, things that you send them, is all designed to make it easier. Not a lot of people think of it that way, but that's what it's designed to do. And you can create processes that like do a lot of the heavy lifting for you, right? So like if you're getting constant trust objections, we need to address that in the process, potentially in extend your sales cycle, right? As in like right now, if you're doing like a three call on average, maybe you do a four call and they're being sent things in between that builds more trust. Like marketing material and things like that, like marketing yeah. material and 
So you want to make sure they're not getting marketing material. You want them to get like, they, they want to get off the MQL list and onto the SQL list, right? When they're on the SQL list, then like they, they get specific communication and information. So they, they, get, they get that stuff. So then it's designed to build trust, right? Uh, so they get case studies, testimony, like, you know, they, they get information about you guys because what you don't want to do in your presentation is go like, so we started in 1994 with founders named Tim and Rick and they love sheep, right? Like, so, like no one cares, right? However, what I do want to make sure is that your company is reputable. You know what I mean? So like that is a concern, but I don't want to get on a sales call with a company I don't think is reputable, or at least I'm not going to go the whole way through the process and then at the end of it go like, well, okay, like I'm not going to waste my time with that many calls. So like I should be getting communication, I should be getting information. I also want to know you guys know a lot about me, right? So like try and combat that stuff as best you can. The best way to do it, I think, is create a flow chart of like the ideal sale, right? So if you've had a sale that was like, man, that went well, reconstruct it, right? If they were a person who was like a referral, it doesn't count. I'm talking like basically coldly didn't know you, perfect sale. Reconstruct that as best you can and then add to it, right? I, I tend to make it overly complicated in the beginning. It's actually the opposite of most but by making it super simple then making it bigger. You should actually probably overcomplicate your sales process a little bit, like over, extend it more than what you would think. So then you can cut it back because it's much easier to add friction, right? If I talk about friction points, it's like places where people can drop off, right? Or, you know what I mean? So like the more time and the more touch points there are, the more chances they have of dropping out. Now, obviously you're not gonna sell, you know, a rebuild of an entire plane in one call. So like you have to work within reason there, but like what I'm trying to say is like, look at it from a whole process standpoint, map it out. What is every single piece of communication that's received by the customer and client? What are the common concerns that I'm getting and how can I overcome that through process that when I speak to them, like I don't have to worry about that, right? That's, that's step one. There's none of that. There's basically like, I guess, I guess part of the learning curve with this is, is that it's not a, that's not, that's not one call. <laughs> yeah, it'll be probably four or five, whatever. I mean, looking at it now, I think it's funny that I was trying to do it all in one call, yeah. but <laughs> okay. So mapping out this, um, okay, got it. And then from there, like go, okay, cool. Like in order to get this person to be in a buying state, like, and that's where you kind of have to, I think it's really good for salespeople to study marketing, right? Because what is marketing designed to do? Marketing is designed to get people in a state where they would like to buy, right? They want something. They have a problem they want solved. And then from there, sales takes over and takes them through the buying process. Right? That's what it's designed to do. So you ha if you understand marketing, sales is much easier. And if you understand sales, you're a much better marketer, right? So there are essential five, there's five key things or, uh, that people have to do in order to be ready to buy something. So the first is that they become unaware. So they're unaware, right? You can't sell an unaware person. Like there's nothing to sell them right? You're just a grifter at that point, right? Then you've got um, problem aware. Hey, the engine on my jet sucks, <laughs> right? And maintenance cost me a fortune. You know what I mean? Like whatever. Then it's like solution aware. Oh, there are companies out there that can, that can actually like provide a high level, whatever, right? You know what I mean? Then we've got brand aware. So like Tina is the lady for that. You know what I mean? Then you have a product. So if I use it in terms of like sales, right? Unaware, I suck at sales. There's sales training that exists. Seventh level is a sales training company. NEPQ 3.0 is a sales training program that helps me increase my sales, right? So I've taken you through all levels of awareness. Now, if they're not brand or pro and product aware, it's very difficult to sell someone. It can be done, but it's difficult and you're shortcutting processes. So if your marketing is handing over to you at solution aware, your process better fix brand aware and product aware. So you have to take them through a process where they understand more. Doing that in one call, like you can't, you can't, like maybe you can, like don't get me wrong, someone can, right? But in order to make it replicatable, scalable, repeatable, yada, 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 then you're better off like really mapping out a process that gets rid of it. Otherwise you end up like, like doing things to solve problems. Like, so you end up writing a presentation or proposal that solves a bunch of problems that you shouldn't have.
Do you know what I mean? And then like, so, so you're sort of underlooking one area, overlooking another area. And then if you ever do fix that, that problem upstream, you've now created a problem downstream because your presentation is too big. Because <laughs> right? it's designed to solve a problem you no longer have. And then you're going to wonder why, oh, why isn't this working? You know what I mean? Like, and then businesses start tearing their hair out. And that's where they usually come to people like me and I tear apart their entire business and then tell them all the reasons why they suck in terms of sales, right? So like, it's just like, don't always try and fix the problem with skill. I think as, as sales reps, we, we always try and do that. We try and really go like, how can I do better? How can I get better at objection handling? It's like, I think the first thing you should do is like, how can I make my process so good that it actually solves all the problems for me? And obviously, like, not all of you have act the ability to change tons. But, you know, for example, when I was doing selling business coaching to, um, to like, uh, building companies, I created my own webinars, right? I had a real, there was a real no like, and trust issue. And so I created three or four different webinars that went through our educational portal, uh, focusing on different things. One was finance, one was systems, one was hiring, and one was, um, like, getting off the tools, right? So those are, like, the main avatars that I was seeing. So I went through the different parts of the portal. With, I showed the entire portal, but emphasized a different part. Then when a person came through, as a part of my call one to call two process, they would receive that specific webinar with specific case studies that were more, most appropriate for their problem set, right? So I just took all the case studies and testimonies that we have. I segmented them via a Google Sheet on you know, like uh, size of business, age of business owner, key problems and then I could like pick and choose things that like had the greatest amount of crossover so that it felt like I was really speaking to them and that our clients were them and it was specific and it was tailored and it was custom. You know, I mean, I was solving their problems. Customer personas, customer profile, is that what, that what you're referring to? Yeah, sort of, but it was on a much more basic and simple level because I was just a dude trying to make it happen. Right, so it was just like, what's the problem, what's the age, what's the size, you know what I mean? So, and then I would just send them an email with like, Here's like the webinar and it's like, oh wow, that portal is tailored to my problems that I just discovered that they had on the, on the discovery call. Yeah, sweet, it is. Well, that's crazy, right? right? And then, oh, look at these testimonies and case studies that are exactly the problems that I have in the exact same size business and industry. Oh, isn't that crazy and weird? Yeah, it's so weird, right? Like, eh, what are the odds? <laughs> you know, and then when I get them on the, on the sales call, like I've solved the problem, you know, and then a lot of them weren't watching it. So I was like, well, that makes my life harder. So like, how do I make them watch it? So I created a process to make them watch it and change my script a little bit, put in a process, some extra emails, another call, done. Good to go. Went from a, like a 40% show up rate to an 80% show up rate, you know, went from a lower close rate to a higher close rate. So process is key. But all right, guys, um, if you're in 3.0, I love you ordeally. I do apologize, but we are well and truly running over now. Um, and uh, I love your work. So uh, love you all, enjoy you all, and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Put that coffee down. down. down.